Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Otsley. Um, I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center for a featured reading with virtual visiting writer, Crystal Wilkinson. Crystal Wilkinson is the award-winning author of The Birds of Opulence, winner of the 2016 Ernest J. Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence, Water Street and Blackberries, Blackberries, nominated for both the Orange Prize and the Hearst Wright Legacy Award. She has received recognition from the Ken Kentucky Foundation for Women, the Kentucky Arts Council, the Mary Anderson Center for the Arts, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and is a recipient of the Caffin Award for Appalachian Literature. She has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and her short stories, poems, and essays have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including most recently in the Oxford American and Southern Cultures. She currently teaches at the University of Kentucky where she is Associate Professor of, Eng of English in the MFA in Creative Writing Program. And it's a special pleasure to bring her back to Vermont Studio Center because she was a resident here um, working in Maverick Studios in 2019. So it's, it's really lovely to be able to bring a writer back who's been in our studios and has been working on their work um, to come back in this role as a visiting writer. Thank you so much for being here. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal to hear her beautiful words and invite her to read for us. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna read a story that appeared in um, Story Literary Journal. Um, and I think I was actually working on this story when I was at uh, Vermont Studio Center. Um, as a matter of fact, I was telling my students the other day, I, this is a story that I've been working on for a number of years. And I dug around in my computer and was able to find evidence of this story from 2006. So it's been in the world, uh, in the making for a very long time. I think the only other thing that I will say about it is that often I give myself a writing exercise um, when I'm writing. And so my writing exercise was um, a braid of sorts. So I wanted to write about cats. I wanted to write about racial justice and I wanted to write about um, homesickness. So it is called Endangered Species Case 47401 for Tony Cade Bambara. All black women got this thrumming thing inside us, but don't nobody notice, which is understandable if you know the history of the world. But that thrum just sits in our bellies. And then one day it comes on so strong that we can't stop it, even if we want to. And that's when your Statue of Liberty might get climbed. Your abusive husband might get shot. That's when she might quit that stupid ass job with her manager who says she can't wear dreadlocks. That's when she'd be in the corner curled up crying her eyes out over somebody black she don't even know. They got killed somewhere again because that somebody feels like a sister or auntie or cousin. You might see her on the front lines of a protest when she ain't never done no shit like that before, loud and regal and effective. And then when you see her out there yelling and screaming until her voice is hoarse, looking like a goddamn goddess, that's when you'll pay attention, but you won't even know why. But what you don't realize is this. This thrum been with us always. These are the thoughts that came over me while I was cooking breakfast that morning in my new kitchen, which I'm sure wasn't the first time a black woman had discovered the deep insides of herself, but it was the first time for me. Big V was moving up in the world, but it had never been my plan to live that far away from my people. Before his promotion, we'd been perfectly settled into the second marriage thing, as though there, was, there had never been a first marriage for either of us. But since we'd packed up and moved and Big V was uh, acting a fool, something had climbed into my stomach and was just there humming. Big V was his own 
version of his best self that morning, sprawled out across the new couch, reading the newspaper with one of his work boots planted in the cushion and the other one on the floor. I wanted to say, Vincent Pickens, get your feet off the goddamn couch. But I could feel something deep under my skin, around my belly shaking and jittering. So I was trying to pay more attention to me, to that feeling instead of him. Two months in that new house and there was my man with his uniform press, his name freshly embossed in blue letters on his white shirt pocket, his face cleanly shaven and his fade shaped up by his own two hands, his mouth just a going, his boots all up on the furniture, all arrogant. If you didn't look closely, you couldn't see the tiny Letters, letters underneath his name that said supervisor in rolling cursive, but you could feel supervisor every time he moved. He even smelled like supervisor with all that cologne on. I sliced potatoes into the skillet for hash, studied my hands, which had started shaking. I wanted to talk to my mama more than I wanted anything else at that moment, but I kept on cooking. Out the window was six stray cats preening and stretching in the backyard. A gray one was perched on the patio chair, fat and round, looking proud of itself. The cats came to the backyard nearly every day to make themselves known. They'd been there since we moved in. Vic V didn't pay them no attention, but I did. Crazy, Vic V said that morning. These motherfuckers. He was huff, puffing up into somebody's politician right in front of me. You would have thought he was running for president, not leading a production team at the factory. Talking shit about, these are the end of times as we know it. I can tell you that these motherfuckers are crazy. This man at work, Nathaniel, remember me telling you about Nathaniel? He peered up from the Herald and looked at me sideways like he was waiting for me to answer. Bay, he said. I wiped my hands down the front of my t-shirt, stirred the potatoes in with the steak and diced onions into it. He went on and responded with the occasional, huh? And I know that's right, baby. But I was really listening to was the pulse in my own neck thumping. I looked out the window again and the cats were gone. By the time baby girl moped down the stairs, I had turned the biscuits. Same biscuit recipe I've been using all these years but it was the new stove, I guess. Baby girl threw her backpack into the chair and flopped down at the kitchen table. When we moving back home, she asked and rolled her beautiful eyes at Big V who had stopped his proselytizing just long enough to flip on the TV. Big V wasn't her real daddy, but he'd been in her life for the four years we'd been married. They got along but were more like tolerating church members than real family, or at least that's how it was then. He looked at her. I threw the biscuits in the trash can. My heart clicked and ticked in my chest, and it seemed like the thrumming thing that was winding and winding like a goldfish fish bowl. Little V began to cry from his room upstairs and I dropped the skillet of hash in the floor, shattering the corner of the new tile, which had been white and gleaming like something off TV just minutes before. Damn, Big V said and looked at me all silly, but he didn't say nothing else. We ate cold cereal for breakfast, which I regret now. And I also regret that me and him didn't even kiss goodbye. Later that morning, little V played on the carpet in the living room while I slung cardboard boxes into a corner of the garage and scattered my prized possessions around me in a circle on the kitchen floor. A picture of Mama Sarah and a stack of yellowed recipe cards that belonged to Mama, a box of unopened white linen that somebody bought us as a wedding present, and a whole lot of stuff that had come to mean something to me. I was just standing there looking at all my heirlooms when I saw through the living room window a woman traipsing up our sidewalk, looking like an after-school special with that blonde hair curled around her chin, green sweater with bright red apples and yellow and green one-two-threes, plaid culottes and white stockings. The doorbell rang just as I was wondering if she had the right address. Are you the lady of the house? The woman said. I am, I said, and held the storm door open just a little. Can we count on you? 
the woman said and shoved a clipboard through the crack in the door. A man across the street was sweeping his sidewalk. A woman was ushering a girl into a waiting car. An old woman was sitting on a porch in a rocking chair holding a dog. They were all watching. They were all white. I held the box of linen across my chest like it was a shield. The woman looked past me to the other unopened boxes scattered across the floor. She rubbed her nose, cleared her throat, and asked if she should come back when things were in order. I didn't say nothing, but the thrum was shifting, moving around my belly button in a circle now like a Ferris wheel. We've got to have some way to control them, she said, and got to clicking that ink pen against her clipper. The petition would, I placed my fist on one hip, which should have been some kind of warning to her because that's how I meant it. Little V was crawling across the carpet and I could hear him getting closer and closer to where I was standing. My word, the woman squealed when she saw him, like she'd seen one of the kittens from out back. She was still stretching her neck to see inside our house. I could see my new neighbors stopping whatever they were doing, mid-sentence, mid-cut, mid-walk to stare. I took the petition, thanked the woman, and shut my door. Ain't that some shit, I said to little V. I handed him a teething cracker and rubbed my palm across his head and both cheeks. My sweet, sweet boy. I placed the box of linens on the couch and read the paper the woman gave me. What kind of people write a petition to kill cats? I said this out loud, but I thought I'd just said it to myself. Cats, I said, because I just couldn't believe it. Little V stopped his playing and looked up at me like he knew what I was talking about. People crazier than hell, little V, I said. I took some aspirin. Out the back window, I watched the stray cats come back out of the woods and stretch themselves in the sun. Little V stayed content as long as I was in sight. He was playing with a toy car, slobbering. If them cats had been house cats, they would have been something else, magnificent. The black one lounging on the arms of a couch, a man rubbing its head or a girl cradling the yellow one like a doll while she played and watched cartoons. But they were feral. At least that's what the woman had called them. But I didn't see too much wild about them. I'd petted one of them when I threw scraps out there. I kept watching and a few younger ones made uh, followed the the big ones out and the kitchens began, the kittens began to stretch and yawn. Beyond the yard was a grove of trees. I was surprised that the trees looked like they had always been there naturally and not like trees planted just to make a subdivision look comfortable. Even from the window, I could spot oaks and sycamores. During the day when it was just me and little V, that was my favorite thing to do. I loved looking at the trees. Little V lifted his head. Somewhere a line from Billie Holiday twisted its way through my head. Like the rest of us, my history with trees is complicated, but I'm a black woman who loves me some trees. You're not gonna make, take everything from me and I will tell anybody that you ain't taking my love for trees away. The sky was brilliant. That's my mama's favorite word. I could see the words straight ahead, the wood straight ahead. To the right and the left, a long row of big white houses, which looked just like the one I was standing in, disturbed the land. I was sure that where our house stood, a farmer tended a field once, or maybe it was part of an untended land left wild. At least it seemed that way to me. And even more years back, a row of brothers and sisters working a row of corn or tobacco, or a young Wyandotte woman picking berries. Now, I know some people don't think like this, but this is the, for real the kind of stuff I think about. No matter how you think most Black women are, I'm trying to tell you something about me. After that, I went out into the garage for more boxes and a quick smoke. That's when I saw a mouse. A different kind of woman would have screamed bloody murder, but I didn't. Its tail was long, curled upwards like a thin ribbon. Maybe that's how they grow up here. I was just looking at it when I saw a sparkle in the tiny eye of my first friend from the Midwest. What's up, I said, 
How to do, buddy? I knew if I could have gotten close, I could have crushed him with one stomp from my shoe. I'd seen Daddy kill copperheads like that on the farm back home. The amazing power of one focused black man, womp. Then suddenly, with the heel of a work boot, the crooked world was safe again. But that mouse, just like them cats, just like me, wasn't bothering nobody, so I left him alone. I called Mama and she said, yes, I sure do remember, Uh uh-huh, sure do. When I asked her if she remembered Daddy stomping them copperheads like that, we both held the phone and just listened to each other's breaths. You like it any better? Mama asked me. I don't know. Don't see many black people up here, I said. They killed us out in that part of the country. Oh, Mama, I said, this is the 21st century. I thought about the history of the South. And I thought about the North too and the things I saw on the news every day and all them black women with the thrumming in their bellies. I wanted to explain to her how maybe they were making a difference, but black people were still dying every day. So I couldn't be sure. So I didn't say nothing about it. Me and mama don't talk about stuff like that, but I knew at any moment that the answer sat right in my own gut. I wondered if mama could hear that epiphany or whatever it was through the phone or if she ever listened to her own insides, but I didn't come out and ask her. I wanted to tell her about the white woman and the mouse and the cats and even about Big V acting sedity, but I didn't. I know what I know, Mama said. I noticed a spider crawling across the ceiling that I'd have to get to later, but maybe he needed to be free to. He was minding his own damn business. Ain't that what we all want, just to mind our own damn business? Then mama said, so really, baby, how's everything really? What I said was fine, but I really wanted to start crying. And that was before anything much had even happened. How's my grandbabies? She said, fine. That man of yours? Awesome. Mama laughed so hard she got choked. She got choked. Awesome, she said. You know his ass ain't awesome. We all good, Mama, I said. And I wasn't lying. I ain't no Miss Cleo. How was I supposed to know what was about to come? Can you read minds? Do you know the future? After we got off the phone, I held the phone up to my ear a while longer, listening to it buzz across three states, missing my mama like crazy. It wasn't but a few seconds later that the doorbell rang again. Here comes this woman with her cat killing petition at my door a second time. Sometimes I just sit back and try to imagine a whole room of white people sitting around in a meeting talking about killing cats. Is that what y'all doing when so many black people are on cooling boards all over this country? The door was cracked a little and I heard her open it up all the way. Lady of the house. She yelled, and I came around the corner holding little V just in time to see her foot about to cross my damn threshold. Did you hear me say, my? What the hell, right? As I rounded the wall from the kitchen, I felt dizzy. I felt a catch run through my stomach that just about doubled me over. I swear before God, I'd liken it to labor pains. How you just come up in somebody's house, lady? I said, and my voice was slow and low because I knew this wasn't going to turn out right. I knew it from that moment right there. I could feel my face flushing, my ears burning like they were on fire. I juggled little V on my hip, but he was steady trying to get down and play. We need 50 more signatures, she said, as she stepped backwards onto my porch. I don't have time for this shit, I said. I done told you once. And as I was trying to close my door, she stuck her foot right in my front door. Yes, can you believe it? Have you had time to consider our materials? She said. I said to her, now, I ain't gonna tell you not one more damn time. Little V shifted back in my arms away from her. I tried to scoot her foot out with my own foot, but that crazy ass woman had her heel wedged in good. How long have you lived here? She said, 
and had the nerve to raise her pen up above her clipboard like this, like she was about to write down whatever I said. What? That's what I said. What? Just like that. Little V was crying because he wanted me to put him down, but I felt like I needed to keep him in my arms through all of this instinct. Mother's tuition, I guess. Do you have a copy of a mortgage or lease that I could see, the woman said. I opened the door wider to make sure I heard her right. I leaned my face toward hers, and I'm not lying when I tell you that I wanted the tip of my nose to touch the tip of hers to make sure I heard her right. What did you say? I said, do I have what? She repeated herself, then got a little scared look on her face before she stepped back and removed her foot. I slammed the door closed, but before I could lock it, the woman grabbed the doorknob and turned it. With little V in my arms, I was losing this game of tug of war. By now, my, my head felt like there were marbles rolling around in my skull. That was the worst headache I've ever had in my life. And let me be clear, my thrumming was there constantly. I knew how it was going to end up then, and there was nothing I could have done to stop it. She yanked the door open wider and stepped one foot back in. Then came this whooshing feeling just beneath my heart. Now, I'm telling you, it was never my intentions to lay hands on that woman. But when she wouldn't remove her foot from my door, I pushed her out as hard as I could. Yes, I did that. I sure did. I pushed her out of my door. She tumbled to the sidewalk. Her pen went one way and her clipboard went another. Her skirt was bunched up around her waist. All the stuff in her purse flew across the grass and her stocking was torn. And it did look like her knee was bleeding, but she wasn't dead. And, you know, I know she ain't dead now. I ain't killed nobody, right? You sat down and talked to her, right? She's still living. Some of the neighbors had stopped in their yards at their mailboxes in their driveways to watch. I could see the tall woman wearing a sun hat and glasses peering at me from across the street. She shook her head and adjusted her water hose before coming back to watering her flower bed. The mailman started up our sidewalk and then kept on going to the next house when he saw us out there. I threw up my hand at him and he didn't speak. I closed my door and locked it. Ain't that what people do all over the world? Close their doors, lock it, and think they're safe? From the couch, I peeped through the blinds and a few neighbors came to her aid and helped gather her things. She banged on my door and, get, and yelled, we'll see about this. And then suddenly it was quiet again. Then later in the afternoon, I was back in the kitchen Little V was playing with a toy that my mama bought him that bounced back upright every time he would knock it down. The boxes were piled around him, pictures turned on their backs when I wanted them to be hung along the wall. All these pictures with my people's faces on them, generations and generations of my family. You got that kind of family? You got family like that? Little V was cute all right, most babies are, but when I heard him cooing and blowing bubbles, I could almost feel my heart rising out of my chest that day. He played peekaboo with me while I worked in the kitchen, his curly head bobbing back and forth from view. He had gotten to that age where he didn't want me to pick him up as much. I was his mother, knew he needed me, but I wanted something from him too, comfort, assurance. I wanted him to live is what I wanted. Thinking about it all made my heart heavy and made me think of the old house and all the people we'd left behind and those who'd passed away too. I stopped unpacking again and went to the window. I shared the sun coming through the window with them cats, with the mouse in the garage, with the memories of those who had been there before. Given a choice, I would have stayed at that window watching them cats all day and not ever emptied one more box. The stillness, the light streaming through the window slowed the thrum down to something that felt like comfort or pride. I'm not sure how to describe it, really. It wasn't safety. I can't say that I felt safe, but I felt like we'd be okay. It was a long climb up the hill behind Mama and Daddy's house when I was a girl, but I made it at least once a day, built, bending back tree saplings as I went. Nothing in the world at all wrong with being by yourself. 
At the top of that hill, I swelled up with happiness. From there, I could see mama's garden, daddy's fields of corn, our house. I stood with my walking stick hoisted above me like an explorer of the new world, but that's what children do. I thought my children would have that same kind of life, but that's not gonna happen. Those woods have been bulldozed down now to make a way for a strip mall. The old farmhouse is gone, no corn, no garden. My mother moved a little closer to town and settled into a smaller house when my father died, but she still raises tomatoes on her patio in a pot. Lord, I said to myself and thought I could hear a rumbling in my back somewhere, but I wasn't quite sure. I stood there shaking the memories out of my head, little V still crawling around on that carpet by himself. I took some more aspirin for the headache. A Little while later, after that is when the police showed up. Ma'am, we've had a report of a situation here, the first officer said, and was standing at my front door with his hand on his gun. Can you imagine somebody at your front door with a gun when you ain't been in no situation with no police your whole damn life? A situation, I said. Little V kicked his legs, but I was holding on to him tight. May I ask what you're doing here in this house, ma'am? The other officer said, we've gotten a call. What? My mouth was trying to find words. What are your intentions? Intentions, I said, and looked at him like I'm looking at you right now. I mean, I know you think I'm done, but I've got three degrees, three years of college. Sure, I know what intentions are. I just thought it was me who should have been asking about intentions, not them. When I hesitated, the older one said, we are going to need you to step out here to the sidewalk. Why else would I be here? I don't understand. Of course I live here is what I kept trying to tell them. Well, some of the folks around the neighborhood here um, and that said that they don't think you live here. Do you have any proof? And they saw you assault a woman here not too long ago. We were looking for that victim. Victim? There still were no words. Hell, I ain't got no words now to explain this thing. I live here, I said again. Can you step out of the house, please? When I opened the door to try to step outside, I saw a mouse hesitate before it skittered across the porch under the couch. It was my peripheral vision, so maybe I imagined it, but I would swear to you that I, that I saw that same mouse that was in the garage earlier. He appeared out of nowhere like an omen, all that fancy house and mice running around. If there'd been room for laughter, I sure would have laughed, but I stayed quiet. I bounced little V on my hip and moved him to the other side, and my brain was fogged up from all of this, but mostly it was my legs that wouldn't act right or move fast enough. Now, the officer said, my baby, um, I need shoes, I said. And then I just stepped out in my bare feet. Was there a woman here? One of them asked. A white woman? Yes, I said, blonde, talking about killing cats. The older officer wrote something down in a little notebook. The younger one said, can you tell us what happened? I started at the beginning, but by then my thrum was threatening to leave my body. I tried to think about all them cats dancing among the sycamores in the sun because that was really on my mind. What was really on my mind was that thing in my gut growing and pulsing. I talked about history, my ancestors and my mama. I told them about my wedding, about the births of my children. I told them about that boy in the park who had been shot because he was holding a toy gun up in Cleveland. I told them about that famous singer who had raped all them young black girls and nobody had done nothing in Chicago. I told them about the woman who had died in the jail in Texas. You know, good and well, that woman didn't kill herself. I said, I said, what about all them black mothers? I told him about the three-year-old Minnesota girl who watched her mother's boyfriend get shot to death by the police. This is why black people don't trust y'all or the police, I said. When I got to the part about the humming thing that lived inside the wombs of black women, the officers looked at each other. 
One looked surprised. The other one had a smirk on his face like that boy from Covington had when he was talking to that Native American elder. Covington, Kentucky, I said. I talked about Covington. I talked about Kentucky. I'm from Kentucky too. Did you know that? I talked and talked and talked. When I stopped to catch my breath, the older officer said, ma'am, we're going to have to ask you to put the baby down. He talked to me like I was a dog and not a woman. Hand him here, the other one said. I'll take him. I know you think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I didn't say nothing else, but I was, wasn't upset about to put little V down. I'd hold him till his daddy and his sister came home if I had to. I'd hold him until the next time I saw my mama. I'd hold him until black people stopped dying in the streets. And that's when I heard the thrum louder than I'd ever heard it before. I could feel it spreading out from my womb through my entire body. And then it left my body and floated like a summer storm above our heads, above the neighborhood, above the entire country. And one cop had his hand on his gun and the other one kept saying, ma'am, I'm going to need you to put that boy down right now. But I didn't. I wasn't ever going to let go of my baby, not until all my people were free. Thank you. Um, I realize that that story is, is harder to read out loud um, than it is to read on the page, but I hope you got the gist of it. I. Um, I always try to embody her uh, when I read it out loud. So um, we do have some time for questions and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So Sarah, how do we do this? Do we open, open it up? Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Um, yeah, thank you for reading that story. I, yeah, the, the ending is just, I'm, I'm still, uh, sitting with that ending because, um, yeah, this, the image of the thrum enlarging, like coming out from the physical body and then taking them kind of hovering above, but then moving over the entire landscape of the U S. Um, just, yeah, what an amazing image. And, um, yeah, I just want to take a moment there for that to, to be in the air. Um, there was a comment, a couple of comments, Natasha, uh, Shelby says, wow, that was absolutely amazing, Professor Wilkinson. Oh, it's so nice you have some of your students here. Yeah, some of my students are here. <laughs> I enjoyed all the details, really made me picture it all. That story was so engrossing. Sometimes during a reading, I lose the thread, but not with this one. Um, and yeah, I have some more um, accolades and, and is this story posted online? Um, yes, it is posted online in, in a couple of places. It, it is um, on the story website. Um, so if you go to story lit mag, um, you can find it there. I probably could post it in the chat while we, while we chat. Um, I'll find it. I'll find it. Okay. And then it's on another it's on another website as well. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you have a question, you can either drop it in the chat or um, ask directly to, to Crystal. Okay, I'm gonna ask directly. I'll keep my camera off because I look a hot mess. But um, I, for one, thank you for this entire story, like reading it, and then hearing you read it were two completely different experiences and I appreciate both of them. Um, by the end of it, I wanted to know, and you definitely don't have to answer this, but where was she speaking from? Was she speaking from like after death or was she speaking from a um, Yeah, well, she's not, she's not dead, but I, I imagined her to be um, in jail. Um, and um, having to really go through something and probably about to be, uh, to spend some jail time. Um, so she's not dead. And that's why it's called case 47401. Um, it's, she's being interviewed and this is the whole time, this is her sort of speaking from being interviewed while she's being interviewed in, in the jail. Gotcha, thank you. 
You're welcome. I have a question. I'm here in the dark. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, great story. I loved it. Thank you. I noticed that your, um, I really like the way you have the speaker address the reader a lot. Like I know some people don't think like this. I'm trying to tell you something about me. Mm -hmm. um, that was before, well, we, I'm trying to find, oh, right, when he says, that's what I said. You mm -hmm. do that throughout the story. It's really nice. And you have this device of having this thrum, which is like so impending of, you know, something's going to happen. And it's beautiful anyway, even if mm -hmm. something doesn't happen in the story. And you said you wrote, you said you wrote the story and you started the story in 2006. So I'm just wondering if you, um, so here's the question. Were you, did the, did the concept of the thrum guide the story? Was that like the driver of the story? Or because it seems like it, or because it doesn't seem like you went back and seeded that because it, it all feels very organic. Um, it wasn't, the thrum wasn't there um, in the beginning. Um, oh. It came in some version years ago. Uh, and so then it was sort of a driving force. But, um, and this, you know, I, I talk to my students all the time about um, psychic or narrative distance. So this is a story when I say I walked around it, that's what I mean. Like I walked around it for a long time and I had it um, from various angles. I told it from third person for a while. I focused huh. on the cats much more in another version. Um, so it just took years to find the heart of it because when I had written it before, it just felt like the exercise. It felt like I was really playing with these cats. Like I really wanted to get in this, this idea. Um, and it just never felt organic until I put it fully into her body and narrated it from there. And, and I figured out that's both the point of view and um, the psychological distance that I needed to tell the story effectively. And there's a, there is a thrumming, a, a certain churning, and that's why it's so hard for me to, to read it because I'm not a performative uh, person in general, but I think that once I start reading it and I sort of step into her body, um, it has such a, a clip and a rhythm to it that it's difficult for me to sort of keep up with her when I'm reading it. Oh, I think you read it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I need, I have a question. Um, that's okay. Sure. Sure. Go ahead, Nick. And then I, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I want to make sure get answered, but go ahead. Uh, so first, it was a very beautiful story and very beautiful reading, and I loved it all around. Um, I guess my question is kind of two-part. Uh, since you were writing it for so long, um, was there like a long period of time where you didn't touch it at all? Or was it a little bit of work, you know, uh, every once in a while? And if there was a big gap in time, how did your perspective change on it after that? Um there was a huge gap and, um, you know, I have lots of files like this on my computer. Um, and so, especially when I, I don't really believe in writer's block. So especially when I'm having issue with the novel I'm working on or the memoir I'm working on, I'll go into these files and start pulling up things. So every once in a while I pull it up and I'd go, there are those cats again. And that lady, I don't know what's happening here. So um, the original story definitely had the cats in it. It definitely had her homesickness in it. Um, and I think at one time the major tension was in her marriage, which is still there. Um, and it wasn't until uh, as they got closer to a final draft that um, the sort of um, the injustice um, issue uh, came up because she had she had an issue with living there in the Midwest and and there not being very many black people around. But this full thread of it didn't come until much later. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Crystal, um, 
So uh, Shanita is asking if um, the thrum, uh, how would you describe the thrum as, as anxiety or something ancestral or both or neither? Um, I think all of those things. I mean, I think that um, something happens. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it happens to everyone. We could all feel it, especially this year. But I think particularly um, um, BIPOC women, um, I think that there is every time um, something happens on the news, it's not just a news story, like it's taken personal and you sort of feel it in your gut and then it sort of piles up and piles up and piles up. Um, so I think it's all of those things, Shanita. I think it's um, ancestral. I think it's anxiety. I think it's all of, all of those things that um, that sort of built up. And um, I can't, I should have pulled this book out, but um, I dedicate this story to Tony K. Bambaro because um, her work has been so um, effective uh, for me. It's been a, um, like one of the mainstays that I go back to uh, her work. And, and she has a story that says, um, blind people have, uh, I don't think she used thrumming, but I can't remember the first line, but she has a story that says, blind people have a, maybe it is thrumming, have a thrumming Jones if you listen, was the first line of the story. And, um, and then it hit me, it hit me, uh, that voice hit me and I realized that I was trying to um, make a story, but I wasn't telling a story that it wasn't on the tongue enough. And I write a lot in first person, but not this close um, to someone's voice. Um, so I think that that's, that's how it all came to be. Um, yes. So another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, Heather Barker is wondering about the age of the speaker and how you navigated um, the an educated Black woman speaking in a vernacular and maybe speaking to crafting her voice. Um, yeah, I say I think I um, misread and I said that she had um, three three degrees, but she has three years of college. Um, so she's, she is somewhat educated, but not, um, she doesn't have multiple degrees. That was a, a slip. Um, but the way that I navigated her, her voice, I wanted her to still be, um, to have an awareness to, um, but mostly the voice is not, um, you know, it's a, it's a country voice. It's a, uh, an Appalachian voice, an Appalachian black voice. So I think that people often um, are more connected to their natural voice when they're sort of by themselves. And I imagine part of this narration happening in her head and part of it is being, uh, is at the interview. So she's not in a professional um environment so she's not trying to um she's just being her natural organic self and so um that's one way that i navigated it and i think that she's speaking in her she every any kind of artifice that she might have has been peeled away you know she is raw so i think that's why her language is so raw um she's much more raw than I am. That's why if you read the story, you realize that I skipped over some of her curse words and, and things. I, um, it didn't quite feel completely comfortable when I was reading it, but I love her. Um, and um, I love that even if this is the only moment that she has ever been her, her true self stripped away um, that she's able to tell her story or that I was able to tell her story um, with this piece. Um, and it's one of the stories that I, I feel like I'm most um, proud of. I mean, I'm proud of all of my work, but I, I, feel, I feel empowered by her being empowered.
Thanks, Crystal. Um, yeah, I really appreciated the first person narr narrator. I, I just thought she was like um, amazing, <laughs> like really left off, like and just hearing you read her. Um, and I also really appreciated you saying that the you, like the use of this direct address um, is, is actually to the interviewer. And I don't think I might have, I might not have picked up on that. Um, and, and also it, it, it's slippery, right? Because it could be the reader, yeah, the you, and it's also the interviewer. And I, and I love that, that it could, that it works, it functions both ways. Mm -hmm. You is, is reaching out to the reader, but also is, is setting up this interview that's happening in, in jail. Um, and, and there's a question to you, how many drafts that it, it, I mean, and you took, it went, <laughs> it seems like this story was crafted over several years. Um, but when, when you got to that final draft, how did you know when you were ready, that it was ready to be released out into the world? Was, um, was it like a feeling? Where were it like, was a feeling. I mean, I know I had written, had wrote, uh, had written it on it for a long time, had revised and revised and improvised and <laughs> all kinds of things. And I think um, when I finally wrote the section where the thrumming comes out of her, I was trying to see it on the page, but I, all my pages are mixed up. But I, once I wrote that section where the thrumming comes out of her and goes across the town and across the country, um, I felt like that was the truest thing I had written about the story and that I was fully telling her, her truth um, and also extending it out away from her. So um, that's when I, I said, okay, I'm done. And then of course I um, looked at it for a long time and then decided to just sort of close my eyes and send and hit send. And um, what was interesting about the story is that I sent it out to several places and um, several journals wanted it. Um, and it just so happened that the story editor, um, he actually had called me and uh, the others had sent emails that came almost immediately after he called me, but he had called me and said that they wanted, Michael Nye called me from story and said, we, we, I really want this story and I had to call you because I didn't want anyone else to, to get it. Um, is it still available? And I was kind of like, yeah, it's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, it's still, it's available. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm honored. I'm you know, glad you're going to publish it. And then immediately um, after that, I got emails from other editors saying that they wanted it as well. And it was so funny because I wasn't concentrating because I was, at a speaking engagement in out here in Kentucky, I think, in um, Paducah, Kentucky. And my husband was driving me around and we were trying to find the hotel for the event and we couldn't find it. And, you know, we were arguing in the car and then I get this call and I'm like, I don't know who this is, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it. And then all of a sudden you're talking about code switching. All of a sudden I was like, oh, hello. Um, but it's been, it's great. Um, that it was um, received and, you know, he's put a lot of energy behind it. Um, there's some news about this story that I can't really talk about right now, but it's been really, really well received and um, it has grown legs of its own. Thanks for sharing that experience. I mean, that's kind of every writer's dream is to have something wanted in many different places, but um, I'm sure it seems nice to get a phone call, that personal touch. Um, and I'm, I hope it continue, I hope it gets continued, reach, reaches more readers. Um, I'm gonna- Yeah, the, the other place I was gonna say that it's published, I couldn't think of it at first when we were talking, but it's also on a, a website called Fresh Ink. Um, and uh, Fresh Ink publishes stories that um, they 
their editors have enjoyed and, and they get permission from um, the literary magazines and then um, they republish them, so. Um, so there was a question about the title of the piece. Um, and I think you, you answered that it's the, the, the case number for the, um, the speakers, uh, is, is you envision her in jail and that the, mm -hmm. the title comes from her case number. Um, yeah. It's also a zip code, um, in, I shouldn't tell you all, all my secrets, but it's a, it's a, it's a zip code, um, so if you type in the zip code, you'll probably see where it is, but it's in the Midwest. Um, and Heather Barker says, I'm so glad she doesn't die. My stomach was in knots. Was there an intentional tension that you built in to keep the reader wondering if she would be killed at several points? Um, Well, yes. I mean, I think that uh, when I when I go went back to revise it, um, I was looking at all the the whole story is so tense, um, and so I had to sort of carefully look at my plot points. Um, I don't really um, write a lot with an overwhelming concern of plot, so plot was a revision tool for this story. So I did have to go back and sort of track it and to see uh, what I was doing and and when. Um, but the entire story is sort of um, intense and I went back and looked at the rhythm of it um, and I keep doing this because when I read it it has a particular rhythm that that makes me sort of do that um, in her voice which I sort of imagined her um, being so afraid and being in a place that she's un unaccustomed to being like she's being treated like a criminal and she's never even had a speeding ticket I mean I don't say that but that's inherent to her to her character. So um, both her fear and her anger are at such a height um, that I wanted to create that because she doesn't know if she is gonna die or not. Yeah, I think, thanks for asking about um, that, or thanks for answering that question. Um, I, I did notice that the you, you opened up the reading talking about three things that you were trying to braid. Um, and I remember two of them, cats and ra racial justice, but I was wondering what the third one was. Um, and that was a question. Um, homesickness. Homesickness. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She really wants to go back home to the mountains and she's trying to follow her husband's dream and not really her own. Um, I found that really interesting that you give yourself writing exercises um, to, to jumpstart something. And I wanted to shift gears and ask you about um, the recent publication in the Oxford American. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that piece and maybe anything else you're working on or something you said, you mentioned a novel and a memoir. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about some of your other projects um, before, we, before we hop off. Okay. Well, I do have a, um, I have a new book coming out in August and it's actually a collection of poetry. So there's the third genre. Um, and I do write in all the genres. I write poetry, I write fiction. All of my books that have been published up until now have been, um, have been fiction. Um, and I have been really interested in the lyric essay. Um, so I've written a lot of braided essays. I've had two essays published that where COVID is sort of in the center of them. Um, and that's the one in Oxford American also has COVID in the center, but it's, it's about, um, uh, it's, it's called COVID kitchen and it's about, um, washing your gro groceries and all the things. And, um, you'll probably recognize some things that you've done <laughs> in that, in that essay. So it's about the sort of routine that uh, we got into uh, at the beginning of COVID and uh, washing our groceries and um, developing a garden, which I hadn't had a garden in many years. Um, and it, so it's in the food issue of the Oxford American and it's also online um, the COVID kitchen at, at the Oxford American. So you can read that if you like.
Um, are there any last questions? I, I really appreciate you talking about working in different forms uh, or different genres. And um, do you do you feel do you feel that allows you to like? I'm, I mean, I'm just interested because some sometimes I I I, I envy different different form. I'm a poet, um, and sometimes I like want to do the genre creep um and over into fiction or you know different and I feel like different um different modes for us as writers allows for different things different projects or different things or different voices to come forward um and is that I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that yeah I mean I think process. one of the things I've learned like I really um each book I write, really each piece I write, every poem, every story, every essay teaches me something new about myself and my process. So um, writing the birds of opulence, um, because I used, depended on the lyrics so much. And um, I, it was the first time I had written and I allowed my my nonfiction self, my poet self and my, and my fiction self to live in the same house. Um, and to come through. Um, so that book taught me that I didn't have to sort of um, bifurcate myself into all of these different um, genres that I'm just a writer when I show up. And um, when I show up to the page, it might become a story with poetic elements. It might become a story that has nonfiction elements or vice versa, like it might be a poem with fictional elements, or it might be an essay with poetic elements. Um, so I think that's what I've learned and, and that that's where I am. I believe a writer writes on a, a certain plateau and then there's a pinprick and you go in one direction or another. It's not hierarchical in any way, like the pinprick might be over here or over here, but you suddenly realize that you're on a different floor and like there's something else going on with your work. And then you, you write in that mode until that's expended. And then there's another print pick over here and suddenly there's light and you move into another phase. So I think that's where I am now where all of those kinds of writer live in the same body and in the same um, mind and explore the same sort of emotional landscape. So um, that's been big with these with these last with these new projects that I'm working on. Um, I really, really, really appreciated your answer to that, and um, it makes me feel really happy that because it sounds like freedom to me um, to be able to a cre like creative freedom to be able to see that evolution in your work and and feel like you have access to to any, any, any genre, or any way of writing. Um, and that, yeah, it, it makes me really happy. Um, and yeah, which I don't know. I, yeah. Are there any last questions, um, for Crystal? Her craft talk is tomorrow morning at 10 AM. Um, the sign up is open until 9 AM. And I will send out a private Zoom link to attend to that. Um, we also will record it. Um, it'll be reshared on our website and social media. Um, so if you can't make it, you will be able to still access the, the recording of the craft talk. Um, and I, I really loved hearing you read Crystal. It was, a, it was I mean, yeah, it was, it was really amazing. And I'm very happy to have you here tonight with all of us. Um, yeah. Thank you. It was good to be here and um, it'll be good to be here tomorrow as well. And thank yeah. you all, all for coming. <laughs>